good morning. Let's stand together and worship him this morning. Holy, holy, holy. Because you created everything. We are who we are because of you. 
and for no other reason. And for that reason alone this morning, we lift up our praise and our worship and our adoration and everything that we have for you because we are created for this, to worship you, to praise you. We love you. Be with us during the service, Lord. May we give everything we have because you gave us everything you had. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. All the tax collectors and sinners were approaching to listen to him. And the Pharisees and scribes were complaining. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And Jesus replied to them, It is not those who are healthy who need a doctor, but those who are sick. I have not come to call to righteous, but sinners to repentance. Everyone the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will never cast out. I have told you these things so that my joy may be in you, and your joy may be complete. This is my command. Love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down his life for his friend. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants anymore because a servant doesn't know what his master is doing. And this right here, this is the good news that we celebrate today. This last line in this reading that's been building to hear that Jesus came for the sick. He came for those who are aside. He came for those who are hurting. Not because he's just our master. He is our Lord, but also, and they all said, I have called you friends because we are a friend of our Jesus. Let's pray. Father Jesus, today we are your friends. That is the radical nature of the gospel, that you are holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, but also you have called us friends. Lord, we, we come before you this morning trying to keep in that balance, seeing you as both our friend and as our Lord. Seeing you as one that we are able to draw close to, but also as the creator of the universe. I pray that that dynamic would be captured in everything we do today. That we as believers, as your children, as those who walk alongside you, would still be able to worship you and lift your name high today through songs, through prayer, through giving, through the time in your word. Lord, don't let there be any distractions come upon us. Nothing that could take us away from this moment. We are in this moment to spend it and spend it with you. Help us remain focused in that today. It's in your name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. It's good to see y'all up in here today. It's also good to have you with us if you are on Facebook or on the radio. Welcome no matter where you are. My name is Brian. I'm pastor here at Heightsville Baptist Church, and we are delighted to have you with us this morning for worship. Uh, we're so delighted to have you here. In fact, we'd like to connect with you more. If you're not currently a member at Heightsville Baptist Church, we would love to help you join in with us and become a part of what God is doing here in Garrett County through Heightsville Baptist Church. we got three ways that you can do that. One, if you're here in-house on our bulletin, we've got a little tear-off uh, there on the side. You can fill that out, drop it in the offering boxes at the back of the worship center, and we will get that and be able to connect with you through there. Or, if you would prefer not to do that, if you're not into the writing this morning, I get it. It's still a little early. Maybe you're just not feeling it. Or, if you're online or the radio, you can go to HeightsvilleBaptistChurch.com. Go to that Connect tab, fill it out, send it to us. It'll give us a little notification and help us know how we can get in touch with you, get you connected. We also, as we are on Facebook Live right now, if you hop in the comments, send a little message over. Uh, Brittany will be happy to talk to you in the comments if you happen to be on Facebook this morning. Of course, if you're here in person, I'm like looking around at y'all like you're on Facebook, but maybe you are, I don't know. Uh, but... Anyway, we've got an exciting uh, morning of worship coming, and uh, with that, Dan is going to come and lead us in that. Good morning. 
whosoever meaneth me, number 421, let's stand together as we sing. Here we go. I am happy today and the sun shines bright. The clouds have been rolled away. For the Savior said, whosoever will may come with him to stay. continue on with the song uh, we've sung this before and I love this song it's really based out of Luke 6 when it talks about the man who builds his house on a rock and because he built it on the rock the storms came and his house still stood you know this is a reminder uh, Pat Barrett wrote this song and, and when he wrote it it was a reminder to us that we can build our life on just about anything we can build our life on our job on our marriage on our relationship off carnal things of the world, off material things of the world. We can build our life on just about anything that we choose to. But if we build it on the, on the rock, on Christ, it's going to see through everything that could possibly go on in our life. This is called Build My Life. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. And holy, there was no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in 
and wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. And I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation, and I will put my trust in you alone. And I will not be shaken, and I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation, and I will put my trust in you alone. And I will not be shaken and holy. There is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. kids grades uh, second grade and down uh, to Children's Church and as we do that uh, we've got a couple different church life events we'd just like to keep you in the know on. First of all tonight at six o'clock is prayer meeting. Uh, we'll be getting together Lord willing in this room at six o'clock tonight for the purpose of prayer. Spending time in prayer for our community, for our church and ultimately for the world. And so uh, we'll be here tonight for that at 6 o'clock. Additionally, we have a special testimony tonight. Uh, we're going to be able to hear from a man who spent over 70 days in the hospital battling this coronavirus and yet will be here tonight to share the testimony of God's faithfulness and healing and seeing him through it. And so I hope that you'll be here tonight to hear his testimony. Also, I want to remind you about Operation Christmas Child. It may be July but we're already looking ahead to Operation Christmas Child. We'll be continuing to collect things for that all through the fall. I know uh, Wanda has been stocking and stocking and stocking, but we need more things. And so uh, we've got a box right over here in this back corner of our worship center where the Christmas boxes are. We're looking for school supplies specifically this month. So pencils, stickers, steno pads, crayons, that kind of thing. If you can bring those in. I know it's the last uh, Sunday in July, but you know what? We'll still take them next week, too. No worries. Uh, be sure to bring those school supplies in here, and we can uh, get our boxes packed up. Last announcement I've got for you today is that we have brothers and sisters in the kitchen on July 27th. That is Tuesday, uh, preparing meals to go out. This is our ministry to shut-ins and to those who just can't get out as much as others and so if you'd like to be a part of that ministry we would love for you to do so we're always looking for more people to get uh, tied in with this awesome opportunity to be able to go and show love to people who are not able oftentimes to get out and get about in the world and so if you want to be a part of that pam Cantor is right up here in the front she will be around after service just floating around uh, she'll be happy to talk to you about that um, or you can go to the information desk in the back of our worship center or, again, fill out one of those connect forms. We'll get in touch with you this week and how you can be a part of Sisters and Brothers in the Kitchen. Uh, with that, Dan is going to come up and continue to lead us in worship this morning. Before Brian comes and shares what God's laid on his heart, let's stand together and say, grace greater than our sin. Sing with me. Great. 
His grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within, grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is grace. We generally love chase scenes. Think about almost any action movie you've seen, ranging from Casino Royale to The Matrix to Point Break and everywhere in between. There's almost always the point where the, like, the good guy or the bad guy is running from either the good guy or the bad guy, and they're going to chase through the city streets of wherever it is they are, jumping through windows and over the balcony and crashing onto a car, but they're not going to get hurt. They're going to hop back up and they're going to keep on running on through for like five minutes. Or, if not on foot, then it's in a car and we've got Vin Diesel and his family and they're going to take off and they're going to be driving through the streets of whatever exotic city they're driving. Or you're going to see, you know, the good guys and the bad guys. And they're just going through and they're taking off. And this has been a trope in media for as long as we can remember. I mean, even some of my earliest memories watching TV is of the Duke boys and the bright orange General Lee. They're going to go out. They're going to be driving real fast and breaker, breaker, over and out, whatever. And then they're going to hit a ramp and they're going to jump a river. Only for Sheriff Roscoe P. Coltrane to fall into the river or hit a tree or a barn or another car and make some kind of yeet, 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 yeet noise. <laughs> and then they're going to carry on. <laughs> I, I definitely cannot do that again. We all love these kind of scenes, right? Like, they are heart racing. Even if we know how it's going to go, like in the Dukes of Hazard, we know what's going to happen every single time. It's a matter of time before Roscoe crashes. Yet, we're still into it. We're still, like, on the edge of our seats, like, ooh, they're going to get away this time? Yes, we know they are, but why? Why do we love chase scenes? Why are we just as excited when the Duke boys get away as when... You know, the Fast and Furious franchise is happening to Johnny Utah's chasing down, you know, whoever. Why are we into chase scenes? Why do we tune in when we see cars in real life? You know, you got live PD on TV and they got a car chase going on. We're like, are they going to get away? They probably aren't showing it on TV if they get away. Just throwing that out there. But we're watching anyway. I think it's because we intuitively, as human beings, know what it feels like to be pursued, to be chased, to have an adversary on our heels nipping at us, and we're just barely hanging on. We're one step ahead, but it ain't far, and at any moment, we feel like we might just succumb. As we continue our Songs of Summer series today in Psalm 7, our main idea I think, builds out from that, it's this. Clear-eyed Christians pray gospel prayers to the righteous judge. 
Because see, in Psalm 7, we're going to see that David knew exactly what it felt like to be chased. And we're going to see how did David pray when he felt pursued. And this matters because if we truly all feel this way, and I believe we do from time to time, then we need to know how to handle this from God's Word. And unfortunately, I think many of us fall to our emotions when we feel pursued by an enemy more than we fall to the Word of God. Three specific ways that I think this morning we tend to fall trapped into our emotions. We, we may fall into anger. When we feel that the world is against us, when whoever is coming after us, we'll go to anger and we'll want to get revenge. We'll want to take it into our own hands. God's strength isn't enough, and while we wouldn't admit it, we're going to just tackle it ourselves. We got this. Or we may fall into shame and think that all the adversaries we're facing, all the difficulty we're working through is, is probably just deserved because we're awful anyway, and God hates us, and He would just as well have it that we just suffer and deal with that. Or perhaps anger and shame aren't, aren't where your emotions go. Maybe it's to fear and you, you start to be concerned about who's getting what, who's getting you, who's coming after you. And so in your pursuit of safety and security, instead of looking to your shield on high, you end up falling into a consistent pattern of trusting yourself or worse, the very enemies that are coming after you, trying to uh, appease them in hopes that maybe you'll find some safety and security in that. We're going to look at all these things this morning as we get into Psalm chapter 7. And I hope that what we'll see is how we can handle this as believers. Psalm 7, starting in verse 1. Lord my God, I seek refuge in you. Save me from all my pursuers and rescue me. Or they will tear me like a lion, ripping me apart with no one to rescue me. Lord my God. If I have done this, if there is any injustice on my hands, if I've done any harm to one at peace with me or have plundered my adversary without cause, may an enemy pursue and overtake me. May he trample me to the ground and leave my honor in the dust. Rise up, Lord, in your anger. Lift yourself up against the fury of my adversaries. Awake for me. You have ordained a judgment. Let the assembly of people gather around you. Take your seat on high over it. The Lord judges the people. Vindicate me, Lord, according to my righteousness and my integrity. We're going to come back to that because that sounds sketchy. Let the evil of the wicked come to an end, but establish the righteous. The one who examines the thoughts and emotions is a righteous God. My shield is with God who saves the upright in heart. God is a righteous judge and a God who shows his wrath every day. If anyone does not repent, he will sharpen his sword. He has strung his bow and made it ready. He has prepared his deadly weapons. He tips his arrows with fire. See, the wicked one is pregnant with evil, conceives trouble, and gives birth to deceit. He dug a pit and hollowed it out, but fell into the hole that he had made. His trouble comes back on his head. His own violence comes down on top of his head. I will thank the Lord for his righteousness. I will sing about the name of the Lord most high. Let's pray and then we'll dive into God's word and build that main idea out from the text. Father God, we, we pray this morning as we come before your word. I don't, I don't know what each of us are battling today. I don't know what kind of anger and shame and fear may be going on in our lives. I don't know what kind of enemies or battles we may be fighting personally. I don't, I don't know, Lord, what each of us are facing today. But here's what I do know. Your word speaks to that. Your word always speaks to our lives, no matter what emotions we feel, no matter what circumstances we face, no matter what pursuits we may be in the midst of. We know your word speaks to that. And so I pray this morning that anything that's of me, anything that is, is just Brian talking, Lord, let it be forgotten, let it be like dust in the wind. But I pray that whatever comes from you, Lord, that that would build up your body, that that would lead people to be closer with you. And Lord, maybe even today, someone may come to know the goodness of the gospel, may come to know salvation today through your word and join your family for the first time. 
It's in your name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. So we're going to build our main idea this morning, starting with clear-eyed Christians pray. And we're going to find that in verses 1 through 5, because this passage specifically, you may notice at the top of it, it may say a something really long word of David. That word, I looked it up, it's shigeon. And what a shigeon is, is a type of song in ancient times that is centered on kind of mournful, sorrowful, or wildly passionate vibes. That's vibes that was not in the dictionary. That's, that's me adding that in. But y'all know what I mean. This is an emotional psalm, and you can tell when you read it, right? Like, if we read this, Lord my God, I seek refuge in you. We're not capturing the feeling in that prayer. Nobody is facing the difficulty that David is clearly expressing, being like, Father God. Enemies are all around me. No, we're like, God, there are enemies everywhere. And that's how David feels. In fact, it says that he sang to the Lord concerning the words of Cush of Benjaminite. Now, we don't know who Cush is. Cush is usually just a stand-in in Hebrew for, like, darkness or evil or something of that like. It could be Shmi, who was this Benjaminite that did not like David, curses him later in life. It could be King Saul who was of the tribe of Benjamin and tried to, you know, spear David to the wall and that kind of thing. It could be some other rando dude we don't know. Here's the point. It doesn't matter who it is. What matters in this psalm for us today is that David was being pursued by his enemies, and this is the prayer he prayed in that, and that is the prayer we are looking ourselves to pray. And so we see, first of all, in his prayer that he's, he's praying for salvation from his enemies. Lord my God, I seek refuge in you. Save me from my pursuers and rescue me, or they will tear me like a lion, ripping me apart with no one to rescue me. Have you ever felt like that? Have you ever felt like you're just going to be dragged away by the lion prowling in the woods? And that maybe your coworker at work is just not fond of how you do things and they've got a different way or they're so focused on their own advancement that they're willing to bring you down in the process? Or maybe the neighbor next door doesn't like when your dog comes over and digs up her hydrangeas and so now she's mad at you and her husband gives you the side eye every time you come out and you're just waiting for the day that he comes over there and has words. Maybe it's even within your own family that you feel that there are heads budding and that if you just say the wrong word, just gotcha like a trap. The Bible says that we know that this is a broken world. And that means not just that out there is brokenness, but in our relationships with other people, there is brokenness. And sometimes there are people who are just gunning for us. Sometimes, Jesus even says as believers, we are going to face persecution. That You could just write it down. Like, we don't need to look for persecution under every bush. And sometimes in the church we do that. And we're like, anytime anything isn't to our liking, we're like, persecution. But we also know that it is a real thing that believers face. We face opposition as Christians. And if you don't know how any of that feels, and you're like, nope, I have never been pursued. All is well in every relationship I have. And everything is great. First of all, you're probably lying to me, but that's okay. Secondly, even if everything in your life has always gone perfect, we have a greater enemy who is constantly prowling like a lion, according to 1 Peter 5, who is looking to destroy us. That, in fact, is our true enemy, according to Ephesians 6, and it's not another human being. We oftentimes in the church want to view the world, put quotation marks around that, the world, whatever that means, as the enemy. But Ephesians 6 says that our enemies are not flesh and blood, but truly are the rulers, the authorities, the powers, the principalities of this age. It is the devil and the forces of darkness who are constantly working to bring God's people down. That is our true enemy. We are constantly facing enemies of a spiritual or physical or both persuasion. And we need divine assistance 
to defeat it. But here's, here's another reality. Is as we are facing enemies, as we are facing those who are wronging us, as we are facing the adversary, the devil, we know that we are not perfect in resisting him either, are we? We are not perfect in our relationships. We are not perfect in every conflict. And in fact, more often than not, when we find ourselves in conflict with other human beings, it's as, at least in part our fault and theirs. And that's where David transitions here. He says, my Lord God, if I have done this, if there is injustice on my hands, if I have done harm to one at peace with me, if I have plundered my adversary, David pivots here from a prayer of salvation from his enemies to a clear-eyed admission of his own possible guilt and sin in conflict. And before we pray for God to protect us and to save us from adversaries, we have to look within ourselves and realize that we are not perfect, we have not got it all together, and in fact, we are probably a part of the problem. We have sin ourselves that needs to be admitted. We need to, like David, confess our injustices, confess our wrongdoing before our God, or we will find our relationships and the conflicts with those hampered, because if we're not willing to admit our fault, that healing is not going to occur. And if we will find our battle with the enemy, with the devil, hampered, because if we are still in sin, our closeness with God is in disarray, and we will not find ourselves strong enough to stand firm against the devil in the day of challenge. We must be willing to confess. Confess sins against the Lord, confess sins against our friends, yes, and even sins against our enemy. Notice what David says here. If I have done harm to one at peace with me, his friends, his family, or I have plundered my adversary without cause. Just because someone is our adversary, just because someone is our enemy, just because someone disagrees with us, does not give us the right to rip them off, to plot against them, to scheme against them, to talk about them behind their back. I don't care what they have done to you. I don't care how far you are from them. We as believers are called to love our enemies, not to scheme against them. And that means that when we do, when we as Christians plot against those who we deem the enemy, whoever that is, we are actively going against the command to love neighbor as ourself. We are actively sinning against them and against God. And we are called to confess that. We are all flawed. We are sinless, or we aren't sinless. We have made mistakes. And before we can pray for God's justice, we have to admit our own. And at the end of our service today, we're going to have a time of response. And maybe your response today needs to be to come before the Lord, either in your seat or at the altar here, and to confess your sins before an almighty God about how you have played a role in the conflict you are facing. How you have played a role against your adversary, whoever that may be. But then David shifts. And this is where we see the second half of our main idea. Clear-eyed Christians, those who view themselves as sinful people as well, pray. But also then number two, what do we pray? We pray gospel prayers to a righteous judge. David transitions here in verse 6. He says, Rise up, Lord, in your anger. Lift yourself up against the fury of my adversaries. Awake for me. You've ordained a judgment. Let the assembly of people gather around you. Take your seat. Sounds like a court case, right? It's almost like David's like, All rise. We are now in the courtroom of the Lord God, Yahweh, of the entire universe of which he created. And court is now in session. The people of God have assembled. And we are now here to hear the case. It's like the opening of Judge Judy or something. And in this moment, David shifts because listen to his, his prayer in verse 7. After the people have gathered and the Lord has taken his seat up on the, on the bench and he's ready to judge. And he says, the Lord judges the people. Vindicate me, Lord, according to my righteousness and my integrity. He's praying a prayer of innocence. 
for the Lord to declare him innocent. But we know in the previous three verses, he ain't innocent. He just acknowledged that he may have some role in his conflict. And it doesn't take a whole lot of reading your Bible just to know that David wasn't innocent. And furthermore, even if he was, you and I both know that we ain't. How could we pray that prayer? Well, David continues, and he continues in the way that I believe we all can pray a prayer of innocence, and it's by praying the prayer of the forgiven. David then, in verses 9 through 11, throws himself above onto the Lord, and he says, the one who examines the thoughts and emotions is a righteous God. And he trusts that the one who examines our thoughts and our emotions, the one who knows all, the one who knows our rights and our wrongs, the one who knows the times that we do wrong and the times that we do right, the one who knows when we have gone astray and when we are living in holiness, we put it all before him to determine, and we trust that he's going to take care of things in the time to come, including our own righteousness and integrity. We are not righteous before God because of ourselves. We are not righteous before God because we've got it all together and we're awesome and we're a member of a church and we go to Sunday school. No, 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 no. We are righteous before a holy God because Jesus Christ was righteous before a holy God. Jesus Christ died on a cross and took the wrath of God for us. And Jesus Christ rose again to give us new life and to give his righteousness to us by grace through faith in him. That is how we are righteous. We are not righteous before the righteous judge of the universe because of anything we have done. If anything, we've done everything we could to be declared guilty. And yet in his grace and in his mercy, Jesus made the way to where me and you could be found righteous. Could be found holy. Could be found pure, could be found forgiven of sins, could be found innocent before a holy and righteous judge. So how do we pray the prayers here? We pray these prayers because we trust that God has got this that we don't. It's also why we can handle our enemies as well, because it's not on us. We're not the ones figuring it out. If it was up to us, we'd be facing the wrath of God and so would everybody else. That's not up to us. What we do is we trust God to handle us. We put ourselves before an almighty God. We throw ourselves against his grace and his mercy. And then we give him all of our situations as well. We trust the Lord. If he handles divine wrath to our enemies like that, that's up to him. If he chooses to show grace and mercy to them, that's up to him. He's the righteous judge. We are nothing but the plaintiff bringing our case before him. So often we like to think that we should get to call the shots. We're not on the bench. We're not the judge. We bring our situations before the judge and he rules as he pleases. And we trust that he will do what is good because he is good. He is our shield. He is righteous. And that's why we also must pray, not just prayers of the innocent, prayers of the forgiven, but also prayers of the repentant. That if we have been forgiven of sin, then we cannot live in sin any longer. And verse 16 says that if anyone does not repent, if anyone does not turn from their sins, then there is judgment coming their way. This is why all throughout scriptures, the mark of faith in the Lord God is repentance. It is to turn from our sinful ways and to come into righteousness, to confess and admit that we're sinners and to then trust in Christ to make us righteous daily, moment by moment, putting him before ourselves. Because if we don't, if we keep living in our sin, if we keep living in our own strength, in our own fear, in our own anger, in our own shame, then what we are doing is we are bringing the divine wrath of God upon ourselves. And he is sharpening his sword. He is stringing his bow. And it is ready. And we will deserve every ounce of it. graphic 
You start reading passages about God sharpening his sword, putting fire on his arrows. You read verses 14 through 16. It is graphic. It's also honest. When you lay down to sleep with the devil, you come up pregnant with sin, and you dig yourselves a trap. We dig ourselves a trap. And the more we try to dig ourselves out on our own strength out, the deeper that trap gets. It is only by trusting in the righteous judge, trusting in his son, Jesus, trusting in the strength of the spirit within the believer that we are able to walk with Christ daily. Any dependence on ourselves only brings misery. And that is why, last of all, we pray the prayers of the thankful. Verse 17, it's kind of abrupt. He goes from these prayers of, save me, Lord, the lion's going to get me, everything is bad, to then he prays a prayer of, you know, rise up, Lord, because I'm innocent, because I'm forgiven, because I'm repentant, because I'm trusting in you. And then the last line, after he talks about violence coming down on somebody's head for not repenting, he goes, I will thank the Lord. Hello. But it makes sense, does it not? That if we are, in fact, sinners who have been declared innocent and forgiven and are repentant because of the goodness and the grace and the mercy of the Lord Jesus, our only natural response would be one of thankfulness. Our only natural response would be one of prayer would be one of glory, would be one where we thank Him for our righteousness, which He gave to us, where we thank Him for the mercy, where He withheld His wrath, where we withheld His sword and His bow and did not pour the punishment out that we deserve, where we thank Him for the grace we have received, that He has declared us innocent, that He has declared us righteous, that He has declared us forgiven, not because of us, but because of His overflowing love and mercy toward us. We sing and we praise and we lift his name high and we go into thanksgiving because we have a mighty comforter and Lord God above who is the righteous judge, who is our father, who is our wonderful, holy, holy, holy God almighty. And yet he cares about me and you and brings us into new life. We sing and we thank him for that. And if our response to this psalm is anything other than throwing ourselves before the name, before the character, before the goodness of our God, and being thankful, we're not paying attention to what we have dodged by His grace. We're not paying attention to the wrath we deserve. And so today, know this, Christian. You do not have to fear your enemies anymore. You have admitted that you're a sinner. You have admitted your role. You have admitted your failure before a holy God. And you have turned from that as a repentant believer. You have trusted that he has made you innocent. That he has forgiven you. And that he has welcomed you into his family. If you will trust him with that, that means you can trust him with anything else you are facing today. There is no enemy, there is no adversary, there is no devil in hell who can stand a chance before your God. If you trust him with your life, trust him with the rest of it, stop running. Stop the chase. Stop the fear, stop the shame, stop the anger, and trust in a God who is big enough to handle everything you face today, tomorrow, and for the rest of the days to come. Will you trust Him? And will you look to the righteous judge? Let's pray. Father God, We oftentimes feel pursued by an adversary. It's oftentimes the case. Your word tells us that the world will hate us, and the devil certainly does. And we know, Lord, that that is sometimes a helpless situation. But I pray today that we would pray this prayer. 
that we would pray coming before you in our chaos, in our adversarial times, that we would pray trusting in you to remove any debt of sin that we have and that we would trust you to handle whatever comes our way. Bringing all of our cases before our righteous judge. The one who has shown us grace and the one who has shown us mercy. I pray this morning for anyone who has never come to see your grace and mercy. Who has not been declared innocent. Lord, there is judgment coming their way. When they stand before the bench, they will receive your wrath. I pray that if anyone hearing my voice this morning is headed down that path, Lord, that you would save them from it. Pour out your grace and your mercy on them today. Work in their hearts that they may come to see you as Lord. That they may trust in you today and walk as a part of your family, forgiven, innocent, repentant, and thankful. It's in your name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. This is our time of response this morning. And so as Dan sings, all of us are called to respond. Like I said earlier, maybe your response today is confession. That you know you have wronged someone in a conflict you are currently going through. You know that you have done wrong. It is time for you to bring that before the Lord and confess it. This altar will be open. You can come and kneel before it or you can do it in your seats. However you feel led, He is leading you to it and you know it. Maybe you today need to trust in Jesus for the first time ever as your Savior and as your Lord. You know if you stood before the bench of the Almighty God today that you would be declared guilty and you would face His wrath. If that's the case, I, I pray that you would find innocence and forgiveness today, not in your own doing, but in the free gift of grace that stands before you in Jesus Christ. If you want to talk to someone about that, I'll be down front, or we've got a prayer room in the back. If you don't want to come down the aisle, I understand. But don't leave here today unsure of where you stand. Unsure that if you were ushered into the courtroom of the Lord, that you would know where you are. If you would like to talk to someone about baptism and response to salvation, maybe you were saved, maybe you're a part of God's family, and yet you've never been baptized. We'd like to talk to you about that. Let's set that up. That is the first step of obedience. Maybe you've been baptized, but you're not yet a member of a church. This is the day. We are called to be a part of one body together. Let's talk about that. Maybe it's Christian ministry. Maybe nominating meets tonight. Maybe you're looking for a place to serve in this church family. We'll find one for you. Don't worry. However, you are called to respond this morning. Let's do it now. We'll stand together. Take my life, lead me, Lord. Take my life, lead me, Lord. Make my life useful to Thee. Take my life, lead me, Lord. Take my life, lead me, Lord. Make my life useful to Thee. Take my life, teach me, Lord. Take my life, teach me, Lord. Make my life useful to Thee. Take my life, teach me, Lord. Take my life, teach me, Lord. Make my life useful. We want to thank y'all for being here with us this last Sunday in July. Can y'all believe that? Summer is almost over. It's crazy. It has flown by this year. But we're glad that you are here with us. Special shout out. I have both my siblings in the house today. And so excited to be able to have both my brother and my sister and their families here with us this morning. Worshiping, uh, that is not something that happens when half your family lives in Louisiana. So thankful for it today. And uh, before we close out, Miss Annie Tilly wants to come up and uh, just share uh, a little testimony and word uh, that God has laid on her heart this morning.
Good morning. Yesterday, I received a blessing. There were some gentlemen, church members, church family from my church, came to my home and did some work, hard work. And I want to thank each and every one of them for what they done yesterday. From the bottom of my heart, it will not be forgotten. And I just want to say how much I love my church and I love my church family. What a close family we are. May we always be this way. But as you know, my husband, he is still in the hospital and uh, they are working with him. Uh, the second leg to be amputated is August the 18th, which is another ordeal that's going to be in our life, but I do know that the Lord will be there. Without him, we couldn't have made it this far. So thank all of you that came to my house yesterday, and thank you for what you've done for me. John Paul, would you come and close us in prayer, brother? Let us pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you that we can come out to your house and we can all get together and worship you in spirit and in truth. Our Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your Son that you sent to die for us and take our place for our sin. Our Heavenly Father, we just uh, praise you for each one that came out this morning and praise that uh, they received a blessing from being here. And thank you, Heavenly Father, for Brother Brian, the message he brought, laid on his heart, he laid on his heart and he brought to us. Heavenly Father, we just pray for those that are sick. And we just pray that you will uh, heal them as it be your will. And Heavenly Father, for those that have lost loved ones, we just pray that your comfort hand will be on them and they, they will seek you, you to, for their comfort and their guide. Heavenly Father, we just pray now that you'll watch over us as we go to our respective places. Give us safety as we travel back and forth. And Heavenly Father, we'll give you all the praise and honor and glory. It's in your precious and holy name I pray. Amen.